let's talk about COVID-19 vaccines. Some of the latest news on this front has come from the United States, where the Food and Drug Administration has said that it is willing to fast-track the approval process for a vaccine if there are more benefits than risks. Last week, the Financial Times had reported that the US administration was considering fast-tracking the process for the vaccine candidate developed by Oxford University and AstraZeneca. Phase 3 trials for this vaccine have begun in the US. The third phase of trials are conducted on the maximum number of people and are vital to declaring the vaccine both safe and effective. Now, the date being mentioned is the first week of November, which is suspiciously close to the US presidential elections. It does look like Donald Trump is planning to use the vaccine to boost his electoral prospects, which currently don't look that good. But he's not alone. Politicians everywhere, including in India, have been hoping that the vaccine gets credited to their name and gives them some political capital. But what happens when medical procedure is bypassed in this rush for political gains? Immunologist Dr. Satyajit Rath talks to Newsclick's Prabir Purkayasta on this issue. Satyajit, today's discussion, let's start with the vaccine issue. Now, it seems that the vaccine is also becoming an electoral ploy in the US elections. And Trump wants to sanction use of vaccine before the election campaign really starts. Do you think that is a possibility? And what are the implications of that if that happens? Well, let's look at it this way. Um, there was a ploy to declare a vaccine on the 15th of August, 2020. Um, and that clearly did not work. This is your talk of the Indian vaccine, uh, that Modi would announce from the ramparts of the Red Fort the vaccine. And thankfully, that did not pan out. Uh, proper pr procedures are being followed so far. Uh, but certainly, following on from that, as well as following on from their own previous efforts uh, um, at short-circuiting uh, uh, due approval processes, the US uh, administration has now declared the 3rd of November to be a potential target date. And uh, it's a little bit further away than the 15th of August. Phase three trials have already started. So is it within the bounds of possibility that uh, the data might come in time for a rapid but proper procedure to, to, to certify a vaccine? There is an outside chance. It's not a very good chance. But the US FDA and its political uh, masters, as it turns out, uh, have now begun apparently making noises about preparing ground for uh, a short circuit of due process. Okay, so short circuiting due process is already being discussed. So well, that's exactly what an emergency authorization uh, use authorization is, which is apparently what is being discussed. Okay. The whole point about having an emergency use authorization is that due process for of efficacy for approval has not been gone through in its entirety. This is the hydrochloroquine authorization or the plasma therapy authorization as well. Correct. So the hydroxychloroquine was um, a... So it's interesting that you bring it up because it's instructive for us to compare and contrast what's going on. So hydroxychloroquine was authorized on two grounds. One, that it was safe because it's already in the market and being used. And two, with no data whatsoever of any rigorous kind, meaning no clinical trial data, that there were anecdotal stories that it might be useful. The emergency use authorization therefore depended on saying, hey, it's safe and it might work. Okay. So at least it satisfied the safety requirement, if not the efficacy requirement. Correct. Now, that's precisely what is apparently being discussed as the basis for an emergency use authorization for what I keep calling candidate vaccines. Okay. Again, it is said, you know, They've already been shown to be safe. 
because they've finished phase one and phase two trials, those trial results have been published, and therefore they're safe. Okay. Whether they work or not, they likely work because they generate neutralizing antibody responses. We'll get a little bit of phase three data that begins to show some differences. That should be enough for an emergency use authorization. So it's been argued that it is safe and therefore there is not so much of a risk. This is the argument. This is, this is the basis. Okay. Um, I, I haven't heard the uh, actual FDA personnel being reported as uh, having said anything in, in this much detail. Simply the more, more uh, opaque noises about we are looking at possibilities. Okay. But this is likely to be the basis. What's, in, what's interesting is for us to look at the difference between a drug and a vaccine in the context of emergency use authorization. Okay. You give drugs to sick people. That the drug has a long history of being safe, you are giving it to sick people, you're hoping that it will make a difference. If it doesn't make a difference, you are hoping, based on its safety profile, that it will do no harm, it will have no adverse consequences. Now, at least the safety has been proven. Yeah. Therefore, the risk to sick people is one issue. But here you are giving safety based on phase one and phase two trials to healthy people, and that to a much larger number. So it's a, it's a little, you're right, but it's a little more compli complicated than that. And here's the complication. Remember what we said about the drug. We said that if it doesn't work, it won't do any harm. It will have no adverse consequences. So let us ask, is that true of a vaccine that doesn't quite work? Now, this is not simply a matter of safety, because let us admit that phase one, phase two trials have been done, and therefore the candidate vaccine is safe. In terms of the adverse effects, I take the vaccine for the next 15 days or three weeks, all, I'm, I'm, I'm healthy and I have had, apart from a little local pain, apart from a little fever, I have had no um, ill effects. Is that going to change if it is given under an emergency use authorization? Not likely. But remember what a vaccine does. A vaccine generates an immune response. The immune response, we hope, will last for a substantial period of time. This is very unlike a drug. You want the drug to have an effect while the drug is in the body. That's it. The vaccine has, is designed to create a long-term downstream effect over time. Now, in this context, consider what might happen. Supposing, just supposing, that all is well, the vaccine offers some measure of protection, and that will say that the gamble has worked. But suppose alternatives. Number one, the one alternative is that there will be an immune response, the phase two trial has said that there will be immune responses. So when it's given under an emergency use authorization, there will be an immune response, but that immune response won't protect. Now, it's caused no harm because you say the people who are vaccinated with this emergency authorized vaccine are no worse off than people who are not vaccinated. Not quite. And that's where the difference becomes prominent. In the first place, we know, for example, in India, we are very familiar with the idea that a pre-existing immune response to dengue virus can actually enhance Second disease caused by dengue virus. Yeah. This, is not, this is not at all uh, to say that I think that's what's going to happen. This is simply to point out that uh, in the immortal phrase, stuff happens. I mean, there's a stronger word than that, but we leave it out. But if that is a possibility, then what we would be dealing with 
is an adverse effect that is generated by an emergency authorized vaccine use in healthy people over a reasonably long term. Now, what? let's also break it down a bit. What you're saying is I get the vaccine and it doesn't really give me protection against the infection. I get the infection. Now the reaction of the body actually makes the infection far worse. Is that the, like, like, this is what seems it, to happen in the second dengue infection. This is what happens. The second one in, becomes much more. What is thought to happen in, in, in the dengue example. Kind of a cytokine reaction. Well, it, let's not even get into Definitely. how it happens because in all likelihood, how it happens in dengue is not going to be exactly how it happens in other instances. But the fact is, this, is this a possibility? Yes. Has it been ruled out? No. What would rule it out? The Has such a case case happened? Would rule it out. Has such a case happened in the past with the vaccines, for instance? Not to my knowledge, but that's because in the past, no vaccine has been authorized through a short circuit. Remember, we said if there's protection, well and good. If there is just no protection, then it's okay. It's no worse. Whereas in the unlikely event that there is exacerbated disease, we would be in trouble. But that's unlikely. You say the most likely thing is that it won't protect after all. But that's not all. Even though it doesn't protect, it will have generated an immune response. Now, my body is experienced with a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine and has generated a response in a direction that is apparently not protected. This might make me resistant to the effect of an actual vaccine. Okay. Okay. So if I so get now that I have I, I have I have my body has experience with some components of a candidate vaccine and has for whatever reason ended up making a response that's not protected. That's background. Now on top of this, I get a vaccine, even a vaccine that actually works. But my body may have very different ideas about how to respond in the light of its own previous experience. So it will react in that direction much more strongly. And therefore, the actual protective reaction may not take place. And while we do not have really, apart from dengue, too many examples of exacerbated infection, do we have examples of redirected immune responses based on previous experience in truckloads, in experimental systems, in human systems, there are any number of examples where a previous experience with an infection modifies the direction of response to a subsequent immunization. So let me summarize it for our viewers. So one risk we carry is a dengue-like response where the second infection, in this case, not from the uh, vaccine, but from the virus itself, could provide a much more serious reaction in the body. So that is one. That's a risk, but you are saying maybe it's not such a big risk, but certainly the more known and established risk is that instead of the body's immune system reacting, which would no, it would normally do, because of the vaccine, it may direct itself in a different way. And that may actually make me more open to infections than would have occurred otherwise. Have I summarized this for my viewers? Can yes, except that it's, it's more that an, a, a vaccine that works may not work in these people. Back, and added to that, the vaccine that works in other people will not work in this may people. May not work in these so people. You have no. actually removed the protection, possible future protection, by giving a un, proper, not properly tested vaccine. Our next segment is about the challenges faced by health workers in Palestine, both due to the COVID-19 pandemic and Israeli occupation. Shada Odeh of the Palestinian Health Workers Health Work Committees talks about some of these challenges. So in a larger level, how has the health system been affected, especially when it comes to personnel and equipment, when it comes to doctors, healthcare personnel, in terms of their training, in terms of the psychological situation they're in, how, what is happening right now? 
Okay, yes, of course, uh, when there is a, the lockdown, all the medical, uh, all the healthcare system, uh, they are not in lockdown. All the healthcare uh, professionals, they should be ready and in the first, uh, in the first line. So, uh, yes, of course, uh, uh, in the earlier uh, 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 time of uh, COVID-19, like I'm talking about March time, uh, most of the organization, even the, the NGOs and the private, and even the Ministry of Health, they have difficulty in uh, uh, in supporting the availability of uh, all the COVID-19 uh, precaution, like uh, the the gowns, the masks, the fields, the gloves, the hygiene kits, and the, uh, all the disinfectants. But now, um, but because of WHO and other uh, international, uh, uh, they start to to have it in the in uh, to uh, to be available and the private sector they start also uh, to to bring this kind of equipment but it was very expensive it was 10 let's say 10 uh, uh, time more uh, their uh, price uh, that, uh, for example we couldn't uh, buy for our our staff but uh, at least now uh, time uh, the situation is much better now most of the broker uh, protective uh, devices and uh, uh, equipments is available <coughs> for the for the medical uh, staff. Of course, uh, the medical staff from uh, nurses and doctors, uh, uh, as a health system, they suffer from shortage of uh, uh, of nurses and uh, and doctors. And you know, some doctors and nurses and uh, technicians, lab technicians, for example, they have. Their only problems that, uh, for example, she's uh, pregnant or they have some chronic disease, they should stay, uh, according to the criteria, they should be staying at home. Uh, and this is what uh, happened uh, in the Ministry of Health and in our uh, organization that uh, we uh, ask them to be to stay at home because they have a pr uh, medical, other medical uh, problems. Um, uh, when the team uh, of uh, nurses and doctors uh, uh, go to in the in the work in the quarantine areas. They should stay there for 14 days. Right. And, uh, after 14 days, they should go back. So this is uh, uh, this means that uh, those, uh, medical staff they are isolated from their social uh, network. They are isolated from their families, from their children. Whether I'm talking about men or women, if she is she is mother and uh, uh, she will not see her child or take care of her child. Yes, this is a very difficult situation. And also, yes, uh, psychologically, it's very dramatic for the medical professional. They were worried that uh, they would be a victim of COVID because uh, of working with the people who are uh, uh, having this kind of uh, virus. Yeah, and there is a number, uh, let's say, of nurses and doctors and technicians. They were infected by uh, COVID-19 and they were uh, um, in quarantine for uh, for this, and they will have some complication and they uh, they have been in uh, in the ICU bed and under ventilator but uh, lucky still we don't have any case uh, I guess yes I guess maybe one or two cases uh, they died uh, from COVID which is uh, uh, let's say uh, something good for. Uh, uh, for medical staff, because we we feel we feel that losing one medical staff or uh, is uh, uh, is it will be a problem for our uh, healthcare system. Uh, in terms of uh, dealing with this kind of virus, uh, there were a plan at the national level to train our doctors and nurses how to protect themselves, how to deal with uh, a Ministry of Health and the NGOs. Uh, we, uh, we, we do a lot of uh, self-support group uh, mm -hmm. ventilation uh, to, uh, you know, uh, do healing for their psychology because, yes, uh, it's uh, very burning uh, for them and for their emotions and for right. their psychological afraid from uh, having the COVID, uh, feeling are they are isolated from their networks and families and friends. Uh, uh, because, uh, the stigmatization also is uh, very important for the medical staff and for the people. Uh, they are afraid and they don't want to 
the other people and their neighbors to know that they have uh, COVID. You know, this is this, uh, the situation of uh, stigmatization is very difficult. So yes, there is a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, psychological intervention uh, uh, provided by uh, the psychologist, uh, mm -hmm. provided by uh, uh, team uh, working inside organization, like our organization we did for our healthy professionals. We did also psychological support through helplines uh, for, uh, for the uh, women, for uh, people with disability, for uh, elderly people, for uh, also people inside the, the quarantine. Uh, we, uh, we have a, a hotline and the numbers, and there is another organization also, they give uh, support uh, through, uh, through telephone and, uh, or WhatsApp or Skype, uh, because also as an organization um, and as a healthcare system also, they deal with, uh, uh, with the victim of violence. Uh, we get, so we continue to provide them uh, support through the uh, phone. We, uh, many services provided face-to-face uh, uh, -face. Mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, through phone call. For example, uh, uh, in, uh, in our organization, uh, unless we prepare, till we prepare our uh, centers as a primary healthcare centers uh, with a tent and uh, a screening area. We were calling our uh, uh, clients, uh, like the pregnant woman, uh, through the phone call, telling right. them what to do and so on. Uh, so yes, we, find, we try to find alternative. Uh, we, we use as a medical uh, staff uh, to work in, uh, during intifada and during the emergency, during uh, uh, in the, in this conflict, uh, to always we will find uh, an alternative. And the, the beauty of the work that uh, we have a national uh, health uh, committee uh, run by Ministry of Health, all the health sectors uh, uh, set and they talk about the plan, the protocol, what to do, how we can divide the work, who can take care of the psychological support, who can right. uh, go for home visits or do uh, uh, mobile clinic, because we continue to do mobile clinic, reach the people in marginalized area, do home visits with all the precaution needed, uh, provide the sanitation material for the people, and for, uh, for the poor area, the poor area and the very marginalized area, provide medication for the people with the uh, uh, with chronic disease because you know, uh, there is an interruption in the system in the protocol for elderly people for the people with disability for chronic disease people for right. women, cancer people so we try uh, to as a uh, healthcare system as an organization and uh, as a health activist to uh, focus and uh, reach those uh, groups uh, uh, and provide them with at least primary healthcare care uh, uh, service, services unless the, uh, the thing go returned back to, to the normal life, uh, hopefully. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news from the country and the world. Until then, keep watching News Click. Thank <laughs> you.